Well, everybody, how are you today? Yeah, isn't it good? Hey, we've, we've so enjoyed being together with you. you you're, you've been fantastic hosts to us and uh, just made us feel so good and shared your food with us and your, your, just your families with us. It's been a really, really rich time. And uh, we've had with you more time than uh, I think any church that we're going to be at, say maybe one, here while we're on this tour in Asia, because we were able to be with you at the dive camp uh, back, what was that, three weeks ago? <laughs> Long time ago, but we had a great time with you, it was fantastic, and last night was just a, last two days have just been awesome. You guys are, you're crazy worshipers here, man, amen, amen. <laughs> You have every reason to be, every reason. And it's been our joy to share some, just some principles with you with regard to worship. And I hope that what we have invested into your lives is going to be something that will assist every one of you to realize that you are called to worship God. Even, even if you are not a musician, if you're not a, uh, an instrument player, if you're not part of a band, it doesn't matter. This is the truth. Every one of us that have been redeemed, God has anointed us to be thankful, to be a grateful people. This is who we are. I am a grateful son. And you are grateful sons and daughters, aren't you? Yeah, because we've been rescued. We've been saved God has forgiven our sins. Uh, isn't this, thank you for, do you have communion every Sunday at your church? That's a wonderful thing. You know, I know in the traditions of some, they do it just only, you know, on the odd occasion. And that's fine, that's their tradition. But we just want to say to you, it's awesome to celebrate the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. It is what changed the world. And what I shared with you earlier uh, uh, the story about the earthquake. Amazing, isn't it? Even the rocks, even the entire, the, the entire planet, when Jesus suffered, when he laid down his life, the entire planet shook. If you get the chance, look that up on the internet. Uh, geological studies uh, with regard to the earthquake that took place after Jesus was crucified. I think it was in the last year or so that they t did uh, some, some geological drillings down into the Dead Sea in order to examine historically what had taken place. And, and the truth is, we know now, geologically, the exact date and time when Jesus breathed his last and said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And boom, everything went right. Everything that went wrong in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve's choice to turn away from fellowship with God was suddenly, boom, made right. <laughs> what do you say? I don't know. In Italy, they say, Mamma mia. In, uh, in, in Hawaii, we, what do we say in Hawaii? I don't know. We just, you know, sometimes there's just no words for it, is it? When, when there's something inside you that goes, oh, that is good. That is awesome. We're, we're trying to find words that are appropriate, but we'll figure it out one of these days here in, here in Malaysia. <laughs> I'm afraid I've offended a whole bunch of people, but anyway... <laughs> Well, so we began on Thursday night, or was it Friday night, excuse me, on Friday night with our first session together of worship to give to you three basic foundations in worship. And I know that for many of you, uh, some of the things that we have shared with you, uh, particularly for musicians, you'll say, man, Bob, I I'm not understanding the connection between the things that you're sharing and that of worship. And part of that is, a big piece of that is this, that a long, long time ago, 
God's Spirit really spoke to Kathy and I and said, your purpose, Bob, is not to be a multiplier of musicians. This is not your call in life. My, and although I am a musician and I do love to sing and I love to write songs, but not, that's not my primary calling. My primary call is worship. And worship, as we know, as we've discussed this week, is a matter of the heart. And so the most challenging aspect of being a teacher of worship is how, how does, a, how does a, a teacher or a minister of the gospel, how do you go in and massage the hearts of people? You can't, can you? It's impossible. Because this is the truth. Your heart, the place of worship in your heart, is the sole domain of you and God. Nobody else can touch that. No worship leader, no pastor, no king, no potentate, no dictator, no one can touch your heart except God. That is a private domain between you and God. And the Holy Spirit comes along. He is the one that comes along. Holy Spirit, who is God, will come along. And he today, who is here today, the Holy Spirit, very present during the communion. Were you aware of that? As you partook of, you partook of the blood and the, and the bread. Aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Healing as we, were, as we were partaking. Holy Spirit is here now. I believe this today. To give us the ultimate of foundations in understanding worship. And what is that? There's three things that remain forever. We talked about it when we started on Thursday night in 1 Corinthians. First one is faith. Being a worshiper, we must say, I believe and I believe that you reward. Amen? Do you believe that about your God? Yeah. Amen. What's the second one? Hope. Another, another word for hope would be to dream. We talked about that last night. And the most wonderful, I, I was kind of looking up uh, the, the Greek word for hope. And the word is to have an expectation of good in your life. And in the days that we live, everyone, you understand that we live in uh, turbulent times. In two days, three days in the United States, we're going to have an election can we all bow down and pray, please? <laughs> Can we all fall on our faces and say, God, save us? Oh, you know, Hosanna. Amen. Say it with me. Hosanna. <laughs> Jesus. Amen. Christians in America, believe me, if we've ever been fasting and praying, we're doing it now. Amen. And we know this, as I said earlier, no king, no leader. Our, our faith is not in governmental systems. Our faith is in the Prince of Peace. Amen. But you see, in these turbulent times, God is giving to you and I, worshipers, he's giving us this foundational principle that we have the expectation of good. And when you have that foundation strong, when you and I have that foundation strong in us, worship becomes a much more natural overflow of your life, doesn't it? Now, folks, I, I, and we're going to talk about this in just a minute, but I, I fully understand that, that uh, you know, as, as human beings, you know, we still have two feet planted on this earth, don't we? You know, some people say, oh, you know, you're so heavenly-minded, you're no earthly good kind of thing. You know what? That's not what I'm talking about. And, and again, I'll reiterate this in just a moment. But it's essential for us to realize that that foundation as worshipers is it's such a solid ground to always come back to as you're looking at the, the circumstances about us in Malaysia, as you look at the circumstances in your family or in your church, things that don't necessarily go right. You can say, in your heart. God, I'm a worshiper. I have faith, but I also have an expectation of good. We can do that corporately as a body. But most importantly, I believe this, is that you do it individually. That you have that attitude in your heart. 
that says, God, I know, I am convinced, I know this, that there's good in my future. Could we all say that together? I am convinced that there is good in my future. And so I dream big. Amen. Amen. And, and honestly, we have been so amazed at this facility. Somebody dreamed big. Amen. It, it, with this, the story of how you, you got this beautiful facility. Wow. I, I mean, honestly, we were shocked. <laughs> Great man of faith that I am, you know. <laughs> you know. It's an amazing thing. So we celebrate with you that someone dreamed big and now... Let's dream. Let's, let's, next generation, let's dream big again. So finally, the last thing that, and the most important of all, as worshipers' foundation is what? The third one? Love. And the Bible emphasizes this one. It says, and the greatest of these, the absolutely most essential foundational concept in worship is this, love. Worshippers, you are hopeful romantics. We are not hopelessly romantic. <laughs> we are hopefully, we are full of hope, and we are romantics. And all the women said to their husbands, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, anyway, but, <laughs> so you understand, folks. How important is this? How important is this? Teaching. And you might say, how simple. Oh, absolutely. Jesus, our master, our teacher, our awesome savior, was so profound in his simplicity. He walked up to children. When the disciples would push them aside and say, these, you know, they're just children. They're not important to us because they're too simple. And Jesus would stop the entire procession and say, you see this? This, you must become like this. Peter, John, that is the kingdom of heaven. Children, simple, simple, simple. This is at the heart of worship is the love of God. And so I'd like to talk with you just a little bit about this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because often when we think of worship, we do think of methodologies or uh, styles. We think of music, don't we, often? That's just you know, how we often think. But I'd like to go with you through 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and just talk with you a little bit about this very beautiful, poetic passage of Scripture. It says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, I know, that, I know that you all speak in tongues because I hear you, <laughs> and that's awesome, and because I do too, both Kathy and I. We actually come from a very conservative background. We came from a very conservative Baptist background, and for us, speaking in tongues was, it's like, don't go there. That's, that's a strange place. You know, only weird Christians do that, you know. So we kind of grew up with that kind of mindset. You know, it was just something we didn't talk about. And then, boom, during the Jesus movement, during the charismatic movement, God's Holy Spirit just came down and, bam! My dad was a Baptist preacher. And one day he was in his study preparing for his, his uh, you know, teaching, and he'd been studying on the Holy Spirit, and, bam! The Holy Spirit just poured out on his office and he began to speak in tongues. And then you have to understand, that's just, that was like, wow, this is strange. And he did something he never did before and that would go, you know, okay, again, a, a, a conservative Baptist preacher going out and he began to lay hands. And if you're Baptist here today, I love you, okay, so it's, it's all right. You can relax. We don't, we, we're, we're still sort of Baptists at heart. But anyway, if, 
But, uh, but dad went out and he started laying hands on all the pews, praying. That never happened. But here's my dad, just powerfully touched by the Holy Spirit. We were talking with somebody the other day about how different people react to the touch of the Holy Spirit. You know, because we're all different, aren't we? We all handle emotions differently. For me, I was like, whoa You know, I mean, I... I <laughs> very good. Wow. Yeah, actually, he was really... <laughs> I get the best interpreters with you guys. It's amazing. Wow. <laughs> Did you see that wahoo? Woo! I mean, honestly, I was in my bedroom in the middle of the night praying to be, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I, wow, you know, just the Holy Spirit touched my life. And I jumped up and I just started jumping around my room. Well, that was my reaction. You know how Kathy reacted? Me and a friend, we were praying over her. Oh, Jesus, just pour out your spirit upon her in the name of Jesus. And, and Kathy goes, she starts speaking in tongues very quietly, you know, just very quiet. And then she goes like this. Wow, that's so gloriously weird. <laughs> gloriously weird. You see, now that, that was her... Her reaction. So we all have different reactions to this amazing God, don't we? And, and, and here, that's just an important thing to remember, worship leaders, people. We all re respond differently. You can't go in and make people respond to God. Remember that. Pastors, leaders, worship leaders. Again, it's the domain. That is a sovereign domain, the heart of man. Between God and man, you cannot force people to... To worship. You can't force them to speak in tongues, any of those things. And you know, if you look at this passage of scripture, it's so beautiful in the context of 1 Corinthians. It says, the Apostle Paul says, you, you can speak in tongues, but if you're not immersed in the love of God, if you don't understand that it's all about the love of God, you're just making noise. And please understand, I am not suggesting that's what you've been doing. But... <laughs> But what I am saying to you is this. Speaking in tongues is just a gift. It's a wonderful gift. But it's just a gift. It's God's love that gave the gift. It's the source that we're going to, isn't it? Worshippers, it's the source we're coming back to. Why do we speak in tongues? Because of the love of God. Hey, how, how many of you like hymns? Oh, I guess you really do. You're, you're, uh, you're singing them in Mandarin and you're dancing to them. But, uh, <clears throat> but there's a hymn that Kathy and I love so much. It's called The Love of God. Do you know that hymn? Yeah. Could we with ink the oceans fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole. Those stretch, stretch from sky to sky. You see, this is the heart of worship. It's not the gifts. They're wonderful, and I obviously believe in them. But God says if we are, are just focusing on the methodology of gifts, how we respond to God, how we do things, then we miss the point, and we just become noisy people. And, and again, you heard us last night. I'm not against volume at all. I love the volume. It's fine. But sometimes it's great just to high rest. In your love, just quietly listen to that, the love of God. It says in verse 2, And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If in our ministries and what we do, no matter how great the power is, no matter how many albums or CDs, you know, we don't even use that word albums anymore, no matter, no matter how many cassettes you sell, <laughs> and if you're selling cassettes, 
Bob Fitz, that's an old, get over it. Okay, but anyway, <laughs> but no matter, no matter if you're number one on the Christian CCLI charts, no matter if your name, it doesn't make any difference. If we lose love, if we lose the whole point of worship, what? I'm nothing, it says. Our ministries, no matter how profound, no matter how much we, how big our band is, how big our church how much smoke is in the auditorium? <laughs> no matter. It's absolutely zero. Unless we are. You know, and again, you understand, I'm not talking against the methodologies, against the smoke and the, and the lights and the LCD thingies and all that stuff. I'm not against that. But they are worthless without the heart of worship, and I and I just and we're going to talk about this in a minute. But I want to want to say to everybody this that that these days that we've shared together they're precious, aren't they? Because we we all of us just have a, a little bit of time on this earth, right? Compared to eternity, every one of us. You, we talked about this too. Have invested time to be here Sunday morning. Some of you have invested over this entire weekend. Good investment, eternal investment. What I believe is that God brought us all together finally and completely at the end of our time together to say this. If you have great worship teams and do all of these wonderful things in your ministry without the love of God, it's, it's not good. It's not important. It doesn't impress God at all. It says this, if I give away all that I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned and I don't have love, I gain nothing. I've worked for years, Kathy and I both, in, in a missions organization. Uh, we, we are not now a part of Youth of the Mission, but we're for many years. We also have a ministry called Alabaster, which ministers to orphans and widows because we believe that God's injunction to us in the Bible is this. Pure religion, undefiled before the Father, is what? To visit the fatherless and widows in their distress and to keep himself unspotted from the world. God spoke to us many years ago and said, reach out to orphans. Touch widows. It's, it's, it's my heart, son. It's my heart. And so we, we have this ministry. But here's the thing. No matter how mission-minded we are, you know, we can strategize to reach the nations. We can do all these things, good stuff. But if we are doing it out of a sense of duty and of sh uh, sometimes people use shame. I know Christian singers who have used shame to get people to go into missions. No, 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 a thousand times no. What makes us go into missions? The love of God. Why do you go to reach orphans and widows? Why do you go to feed the poor and, and needy? Why do we do that? Is it because there's need? There's always going to be need. No, we go because, oh, love of God, how rich and pure. How, you understand? So that when you look into the eyes of children, you're not seeing a hungry child. You are seeing God's child for whom he gave his only son. What a difference. It's different. You know, we, we, we've got tons of ministries today, folks, and thank God for these ministries. I am so grateful for the compassion of the church. Amen? The church around the world is just such a gift to this planet. And God always takes us back to what is the motivation? It is this, the love of God. Now, I began to ponder this this morning because particularly, I mentioned the other day, this passage of Scripture is used a lot in weddings. 
And I mentioned too that Kathy and I have been married now for 40 years. Yeehaw. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and Kathy and I, you know, as in any marriage, we've been through some profoundly difficult times. All sorts of, for all sorts of reasons. Usually, me being stupid, but, you know, I mean, and all the husbands said, no amen? <laughs> amen. Yeah, a defeated amen. Amen. <laughs> Not a victorious amen. <laughs> yeah. I was talking once about marriage at a, at a teaching or something, and I... And, uh, you know, we're talking about how God guides us together and gives us our, our life partner, you know, and, and all the women were saying, Amen! <laughs> and then one of them said, Amen! <laughs> <laughs> okay, listen to this, verse 4. Love is, love is patient and kind. Love doesn't envy or boast. Now, when, when Kath and I got married... You know, as with any, in any, you know, on the day that you get married, there's a piece of, of, of that whole event that is sort of fairy tale and, uh, you know, kind of, wow, you know, we're going to live together forever or, you know, at least here on this earth. And, you know, we're just, it's just awesome. And, and the stars are in our eyes and, and that sort of thing. And, and yay, that's, that's romance, isn't it? And then you live together, and you begin to realize that, who wrote this 1 Corinthians 13 thing? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, love is patient. And, and it sounds so good, doesn't it? Love is patient and, and kind. And then you live together, and, and you realize, uh, we all have these idiosyncrasies about our life that are, are really uh, irritating, you know, no, but not Kathy. <laughs> oh God, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> just, just, but just real exceptions here, you know. <laughs> but you know, love. I mean, I could ju- I, I could spend the entire morning as all of you could as well, even the ones that are not married, because you know that in life. You know, we talk about romance. We watch a romantic movie, you know, or whatever. And I'm a sucker. I I apologize, guys, but I like watching chick flicks. (laughs) I'm just so sorry. I I ball like a baby. You know, I I don't know what what movies. Oh, I know we watched one the other night. We watched, uh, what's the one from England? Oh, the, the Agatha, Pride and Prejudice. I'm so sorry, guys. I, I, can, I, I apologize. You're, look, you're looking really scared. All the guys are going. But we watched Pride and Prejudice, and at the end I'm going, Oh, God. I need to be more of a gentleman, you know. I've threatened to Kathy over and over. I'm going to take a gentleman's school. I'm going to learn how to be more like one of those stately British gentlemen, you know. Like Chris. <laughs> Oh, man. Shave your beard, bro, and you'll be good. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just going to give you a, a recent example of, of how, you know, when we read these things and we juxtapose our life over the comparison of 1 Corinthians 13, I mean, if you look too hard at it, Especially in the marriage relationship, you just kind of forget it. I can't live up to that. And I've always felt that, you know, in my personality, I, I love to bless Kathy. I think most husbands do. We, we love, it's, it's what God is. You know, it's who God is, isn't it? We love to bless our mates, you know, our, 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 our soulmate. We love to do that. And, and I, you know, you, you already know, I've got sort of a strong sort of feminine side to me. So I love to take flowers to Kathy and, and, and I love to do that sort of stuff. And in kind of way, I've been maybe a little pride, prideful about that. So recently, we celebrated our 40th anniversary and spent 10 days in Mexico and just had a wonderful, wonderful time. 
But uh, we came back, it was just like a, a week later, and we were ministering up in Columbus, Ohio, and uh, I'm sitting at breakfast, and we're eating breakfast, getting ready to go, I, I think do some ministry or something, and Kathy is texting my assistant, my, my personal assistant, and I look over at her text, and Melissa writes a text to Kathy. Oh, happy birthday, Kathy. What a great day. I'm so excited for you. <laughs> and this, my, my face went ashen white. You know, I think, I think I had an egg in my mouth and it fell out, you know. It was like, oh, no. I totally forgot her birthday. And I think I tried to hide it. You know, I was eating real fast. Oh, God, what do I do? <laughs> and Kathy was sitting there. I kind of had the feeling she suddenly realized. She, she, yeah. <laughs> she knew two days before I was going to forget. What? The way I knew he had forgotten is because he really is very romantic. <laughs> and he always has these big plans that are coming, and he usually wakes up two hours before I do to bring flowers and get something going for me before. And I, I there, on, was, there was nothing going on, so I already knew he'd forgotten it, and I thought it was funny because I knew he was going to be sweating it out even though I wasn't. <laughs> she enjoyed every moment of it. It was like... Yeah, so, anyway, so I made up for it. We, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you about that. But anyway, so, so, so I, what, what, I guess what I'm saying to you, and all of you hear it, you know it loud and clear, don't you? You know, I, I can remember a few years ago, I was at a conference, and a guy was preaching on prayer. And he was upholding this incredible standard of, you know, we need to pray. And, and he was quoting, the, uh, you know, what Jesus said to the, to the disciples, you know, could you not watch with me one hour? And, and, and I, I love Jesus' words, but this particular uh, um, individual was using those words. And, and guys, I'm not doing that this morning to, to shame you. Okay. But what I'm saying, as the wives are slapping their husbands, you don't bring me flowers. You know, but anyway, so so what happened was he was going on and on and on about using shame. Lord, just cover him in Jesus' name. You know, there's some strong, strong conviction happening. Is that what it is? <laughs> Boy, the florist stores are going to be sold out tomorrow. But all of us, there were you know, probably 20,000 people at this conference, and the more this guy was preaching, the more we went, gosh, I don't pray enough, I don't pray enough. Oh, God, I'm, I'm such a slob. I'm, I'm a demon. I'm so bad. You know, it's like, you know what I'm saying? How, how, and he just was making us feel so bad because we don't pray enough. Well, the next speaker got up and he said, guys, you know, I, I, I want to honor the previous speaker in his intent and desire to see the church pray. I agree with that 100%. He said, but I'd like to just share with you my life. And he began to tell us how his life fell far short of praying enough. He would say, I've made vows. I'm going to get up and I'm going to pray. And, he'd, and then he described how he would shut off the alarm clock every time it would go off. He would use the snooze button. You know, it was time to pray, you know, and he'd sleep for, you know. He said, and by the time he was done, we were all roaring with laughter at our humanity. Because you see, so often in worship, when we talk about love, the emphasis becomes, you need to love God more. You need to be more loud in your worship. You need to be more passionate in your and the and the focus becomes kind of like this. You begin to to read it through through the eyes of this standard, and I'm not there. I'm not there. And and so the beautiful thing about this passage 
is that it takes us to a supernatural love. 1 Corinthians 13 is talking about, let's say this, the love of God. It's talking about the highest standard of all, agape love. God is so beautiful this morning. Uh, we were talking with uh, our brother, um, Nigel, thank you. Love you, bro. But anyway, <laughs> sorry. We were talking about little ways that God shows his love towards us. And it was so wild. He was telling us this amazing story of, of how God was just revealing his love to him. And we were driving in, and as he's telling this story, there's this big banner that says, God is love. There is, there is no way, folks, somebody needs to pray. There's an alarm going off. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on snooze. <laughs> so, yeah, isn't this amazing? You see, the, the point of this this morning, and I believe the point of 1 Corinthians 13, is it sets the standard that says this is who our God is. Our God is patient. He is kind. He doesn't, he isn't envious. He doesn't boast. He's not arrogant or rude. And I believe that these are the characteristics of God. And yes, I do believe that as we embrace the love of God, I do believe that these characteristics get written into our heart, don't they? I do believe that. But I believe that if we try to worship God by, by trying to love God more, then we entirely become religious because the focus becomes us rather than the love of God. And so my dear friends here, as, as a worship leader, as, as someone who feels that God has called me to multiply worshipers in the earth, not musicians, but worshipers, I say to you, this is the highest, highest call the highest call to you believers, every one of you, because you are all called to worship God, every one of you, even if when you sing, birds fall out of the sky because it's so bad. <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> Someone says, yes, I know. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Because it, because it is your heritage as Christians this is our eternal call. It is who you are. You are called to worship God. You are purposed in your DNA. The moment you got saved for eternity, you will cast your crowns at the feet of Jesus. You will worship God. Why is that? Because you are unconditionally, perfectly, completely loved by God the embodiment of love. Could you say with me, God is love? God is love. Yeah, let me hear that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Could you do that in Malaysian? Or in <laughs> yeah. Quick story and then I'm going to ask the band to come up after I share this story, but I um, want to read to you as I begin to wrap this time up a verse of scripture that we have read many times during this, this conference. And it's found in uh, 1 John chapter 4. First John chapter 4, and let's look at verse, I believe it's verse 10. <clears throat> In verse 10. In this is love. This is love. Not that we have loved God, worshipers. Not that we have loved God. Do you want to increase in worship? Immerse yourself in this scripture. But that he loved us. Oh, the communion's not there anymore, but it was earlier. 
but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is love. This is love. This is perfect worship. This is how we become worshipers, is that we allow in our lives, is that we, if you will, pursue the Holy Spirit and ask him, show me your love, God. Reveal to me how much you love me. That's, the most, that's a perfect prayer. It is not a selfish prayer. It's a prayer that God loves for you to pray, to say, God, I need a revelation. I need you to show me how much you love me. And I will tell you this, our mighty sovereign king is going to find unique ways for every one of you to show you how much he loves you. And there'll be ways that only you know about. You you know, that, that secret place in your heart, the secret desires of your heart, only you will know. There'll be the whispers of heaven to your heart. God will romance you. God will romance you. And guys, don't be afraid of that. He's in love with you. You know, it's not a, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about. We're talking about God Almighty romancing, romancing every one of us, giving you revelation, you and I, revelation of how much he loves us. This is so profound, it is absolutely difficult to communicate. But I say to you that as we immerse ourselves In revelation of the love of God, you know what will happen? A song is going to come out of you. You'll start writing songs. You'll start painting. You'll start, the creative part of your life will come alive because this is who you were created to be. You will become so prolific in in your worship because you will see it as something more than just singing a song. You will see it as that my life becomes an expression of worship to God. In all that I do, in all that I say, that, and, and, and you don't see it through the eyes of, you know, I have to live up to this standard. You see it through the eyes of, I have to get a revelation of God's love for me. And that God writes 1 Corinthians 13 on your heart. When uh, Kathy and I had our, f- when we found out that Kathy was pregnant with our first child, about the eighth, or it was, the ninth month, we just, Kathy said, Bob, I think it would be really good. Let's go, let's go have, it was the eighth month. That's right. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, the eighth month, we said, look, um, we're entering into a new phase in our marriage. We've got our first child coming. Let's go spend our last vacation together. <laughs> uh, not our last, but our last vacation as just, sing, you know, just a couple. And so we, we, we had uh, this, this uh, plan to uh, get a, a nice big, we, we were living in Southern California at the time, and we've always loved the beach. So we decided, let's go down, get a nice big, um, what would you call it, uh, a motorhome, <clears throat> and go down and park the motorhome on the beach, and let's just spend a week on the beach together, you know, uh, just having our last vacation as a single, you know, as, as a couple before we have children. So we went down, <clears throat> and during that week, I decided to read. How many of you have read the Chronicles of Narnia? <clears throat> How many of you don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Raise your hand if you don't know what that is. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to shame you. I'm just... Uh, cr- uh, a series of, of children's books actually written by C.S. Lewis, a famous British um, writer who loved Jesus and who beautifully wrote these a series of books that were an allegory of the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and uh, so in this book, Jesus was represented by a lion called Aslan. And there were the, the, the characters in the story were uh, different ones that represent different ways that we respond to God. The, I think the favored one is, I think it's Susan, is that right? Lucy, excuse me. Lucy was the little girl, is that correct? The one that believes. Help me, correct me, guys, if I get this wrong. But, uh, um, and 
Susan was the one who was a little more grown up and a little less prone to, to believe in Aslan and all that sort of thing. So I'm on the beach in Southern California reading this book, and there's this one scene in one of the books where um, Susan and Lucy are in the forest, and it's in the middle of the night, and, and Lucy, the, the young one, the one with faith in her heart, woke up and suddenly went, oh, I, I sense that Aslan is here. Aslan is here. He's somewhere around. I know. I can sense his presence. And I'm on the beach reading this, and something inside my heart starts, starts going, oh, wow. Well. You know, you know as, a, as a Christian, as a worshiper, you know, we have this um, awareness, don't we, of the presence of the Master. And he's always with us, but there's times when we have this keen awareness of it, isn't it? And so, um, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, oh, I love that feeling. I love that sense of God is near. And uh, she gets up out of her tent and walks out. And literally, the trees. It's, she looks up and she begins to see the trees. It's almost as though they're, they're uh, waving and, and almost talking. And they become animated. And uh, as, again, I'm on the beach, and I'm looking around at, the, at, at this beautiful beach, and I'm just sensing the creator, the maker of heaven and earth. You know? And, and, and then in the story, she, she's trying to find, where is Aslan? I know he's here somewhere. I know he's here. And she walks out into this big, beautiful, open sort of a field. And sure enough, she looks across this field and on the other side, Aslan is there. And she looks and she sees Aslan and she goes running toward him, this little girl, you know, and, and, and Aslan sees her and he, this big massive lion just comes running for her. And he runs over to her and he throws her up in the air onto his back and they go running around. By this time, I'm on, tears are streaming down my face. I'm just saying, Jesus, Jesus, this is who you are. This is who you are. Oh, and I forgot one very key aspect of it. The thing that woke uh, Lucy up was a bright full moon. She was in her tent in this full moon, and she looked out, and it was so bright she could see color. And that's what woke her up to go out and meet Aslan. I sat there weeping, and I said, my father, would you do that? I want, I want to experience something like that. You know what I'm talking about? You know, just I, I would love to, to experience that kind of thing. And it's kind of a kind of a crazy prayer, isn't it? Because it's a it's a fable. It's a you know, it's a story. But still, I said, God, I want that experience. Well, that night, Kathy and I uh, went to our camper van, and our our our, our motorhome was parked on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It was a beautiful scene. Middle of the night, I'm laying in bed, and suddenly I'm squirming around, and I open my eyes, and I look up, and the full moon is blasting through the window, right through my eyes, right into my eyes. And it was like the Holy Spirit said, you asked. <laughs> and I said, Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I pushed the snooze button, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, Jesus, I, I'm so spiritual. Oh, I want to be with you, Jesus. You know, thank you, Jesus. And God, the big moon, you know, shining through. And I fell right asleep. <laughs> and then, honestly, I, you know, I just love my God, the creator of heaven and earth, the earth. As, as the night went on, moved for, until the moon was just full blasting in, in the window, right in my eyes. And uh, again, even brighter now. And I woke up, and fi I realized, okay, I, I get the message, God. You know, so so I, it's maybe 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I woke up, got out of the motorhome, and I walked maybe 10 yards over to the edge of this cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And I stood there and I, I lifted my hands and I said, Jesus, I worship you, Lord. I just, 
I worship you, my Father. That God would wake me up in the night like that after reading that story. You know, it's not something. I just, there's no, that wasn't an accident. You know, I didn't know it was going to be a full moon that night. And as I raised my hands, check this out. There is a condition in Southern California where plankton get in the water and the plankton are full of phosphorus. And there are times on the beach in Southern California where you can walk, if that plankton is on the beach, you kick the sand and it's like fireworks because the phosphorus comes out of the sand and it makes like a, a burst of green glow. across. I had no idea. God had herded up all the plankton. Can you see God? Come on, plankton, let's get going. <laughs> Bob's wanting an experience here. You know? <laughs> and all these little plankton are, yes, God, you know, they're kind of yeah, <laughs> coming up to this beautiful big beach. I mean, I'm, how high would you say? I don't know, it's maybe a 50 foot cliff. I don't know. Yeah, just a beautiful, sweeping view. And this massive wave comes up as I'm worshiping on that cliffside. And I look down, and that wave crashes on the beach. And as it does, the plankton went, yippee! And the entire wave lit up phosphorus green all across this beach. It's like as I'm worshiping, God gave me a light show right in front of me. Beautiful scene. I just sat there weeping, saying, God, I, you are amazing. You are amazing, God. See, the re here's what happens in us, everyone. When we, when God opens our eyes to his love for us, you don't have to be coaxed by a worship leader to worship. You just go, woo, just like those plankton, you know. <laughs> yeah. Amen. This is love. God is love. You know what is so amazing about that? Is that that night Kathy went into labor to bear our first child. And... <laughs> That's another story in itself. But anyway, <laughs> just to say, we had two cars on our little vacation, and Kathy was in labor, driving along, trying to get to the hospital. You know, it was, it was wonderful. But anyway, I, and I can say that as a man. But uh, you know what? I tell you, I find it such a beautiful, beautiful allegory. That in the presence of God worshiping Jesus, he gave me my first son. It, it, worship births new things, church. Do you hear me? Worship births vision. It's why that hope is so important. When We talked about this last night. In the place of worship, God awakens your dreams. He awakens your expectations of hope for the future. For some of you who are wanting children, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really serious that, that in worship, that in that place of romance and love with Almighty God, God conceives in us dreams and visions. Amen? Could the band, could the band just come up? And let's all stand together. This morning, I believe that our God is raising up an army, an army of worshipers. It is who you are, amen? And you are people who are enraptured in the love of Jesus. And here's what we are praying for you, for every one of you. In the final word that we share with you today in this conference what my prayer is what our prayer is is are we okay here we go okay uh is this i pray for some plankton in your life amen what i'm asking for and it's just a little strong you can pull it down in my in my vocal monitor is that god is going to meet you like aslan met 
Lucy. Yeah? Would you like that? Yes. Yes, you would. Go ahead, church. Begin to lift your voice to God and ask him. Jesus said, ask. Ask and receive that your joy may be full. Go ahead. Ask God to reveal to you his love. Ask God to show you how much he loves you. And he's going to meet you in a unique way just for you.